Stanford University. Good morning, everyone. So first, let's welcome Professor Roland Hall, Director for Precor Institute, to kick off the summit for us. Roland. So good morning, everybody. My name is Roland Horn, as you heard. I'm the interim director of the Precourt Institute for Energy and a professor of energy science and engineering here at Stanford inside the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. I'm also the director of the Stanford Geothermal Program. So we'd like to welcome you to this uh, inaugural event, the Stanford Energy Summit. Um, this is actually Stanford Government Energy Summit. Uh, this is actually two events in one. Uh, today we're focusing on California, uh, co-sponsoring with the California Energy, uh, California Energy Commission, uh, and tomorrow co-sponsoring with DOE for, uh, to look at the launch of a new program here at Stanford called Earnest. So in today's event, we're going to explore how universities and all of you uh, can collaborate together to support uh, California's decarbonization goals. So California's targets include uh, non-zero carbon emissions and 100% clean energy by 2045, which is 21 years from now. So in the Precourt Institute for Energy, our vision is sustainable, affordable, secure energy for all. And our mission to bring that vision to reality is through research and education. So Stanford University itself is committed not only to sustainability scholarship, but also to sustainable operations. So here at the university, we have 100% renewable electricity supply, a fleet of all electric buses, as well as aggressive programs to improve energy efficiency across the campus, conserve water, and also to reduce waste. So we have an awesome lineup of speakers and panel members in today's event uh, that include participants, the heads from three California state agencies, uh, two of the state's two main public utilities, and we have joining them two state senators, so welcome Senator Becker and Stern. We have investors, energy entrepreneurs, senior executives from the Department of Energy, uh, researchers from Stanford University, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And also data scientists from our neighbors down here in Mountain View from Google. And of course, all of you, and uh, I welcome you all as well. Not to mention, of course, quite a significant number of Stanford faculty, research staff, and students who will be part of today's event. So I'm going to introduce next the, my boss, the dean of the, school, uh, the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Uh, who is Arun Majumdar. So in addition to being dean of the Doer, Stanford Doer School, he's also professor of mechanical engineering as well as energy science and engineering and also photon science. So he chairs the advisory board of the US Secretary of Energy, uh, Jennifer Granholm. And in 2009, President Obama uh, appointed Arun to be the first director of the advanced Research Projects Agency, hyphen energy, known to us as ARPA-E, where Arun actually led the creation of the agency and took it to become a very uh, innovative and successful agency. Uh, before that, he was a professor at another university uh, across the bay. <laughs> so please welcome Arun Majumdar. Thank you, Roland. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Let me thank the staff of the Precourt Institute for putting this all together. Well, let me start by expressing my deep gratitude to the California Energy Commission for partnering with Stanford 
to create the Stanford CEC Energy Innovation Summit, or as we called it, the California Day. Let me also welcome all the leaders, the representatives of the California government, representatives of all community organizations, representatives of corporations, my fellow academics and national lab staff from around California, as well as you who are here in person as well as on, online. The world faces a unique challenge and opportunity. Eight billion people going to 10 billion by mid-century, a hundred trillion dollar global economy that is growing, that is based predominantly today on fossil fuels. The world is embarking on the largest transition humanity has ever undertaken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while growing the economy. All major nations, all major corporations and organizations have made commitments to reduce their emissions. But no one has really figured out how to navigate this future. They're willing to embark on this journey, but they're uncertain about how to do so while creating a prosperous and secure future for the people. That is the world we live in today. People are looking for help. They're looking for solutions. And they're looking for a model of excellence. What people need at the end of the day, very simply, is a decent job, food on the table, enough money to pay their medical bills, and send their kids to college, a decent home to live in, a future for their kids that is more promising than their own, and to live in a community of friends and family where they can watch the 49ers cream the Detroit Lions <laughs> to go to the Super Bowl. I'm sorry, I had to slip that in. I almost lost my voice last night. Well, that's the California dream, the American dream, and frankly, this is the dream of all people around the world. These people are now ravaged by heat waves, by wildfires, floods and droughts at an unprecedented scale. They need protection. They're being asked to go on a carbon diet while continuing to believe and build on their dream, as they should. As someone who has been on a few diets myself, let me assure you, they don't last very long unless there are some fundamental changes in how we approach life. What are those fundamental changes? That is why we are gathered here today to discuss and identify. Well, with a GDP of almost $4 trillion, California has the fifth largest economy in the world, including the United States. It has a diverse population, frankly, from all over the world. It is a microcosm of the world. It is known as much for its technology and biotechnology sector as it is for the agricultural one. It has a set of public and private educational and research institution and national laboratories that are the envy of the world and a paragon of knowledge, innovation, and excellence. Historically, California has been at the forefront of energy and the environment. Going back to the 1970s, California created the energy efficiency standards, the building codes, the utility decoupling policies, and many, many more. And many of which were adopted by other states and the United States federal government, as well as many other nations around the world. It's really been the model of excellence. The world is now asking, for a model of excellence, how to approach the future that involves a carbon diet, protecting our communities from the extremes of climate change, and creating a prosperous and secure future for our children and grandchildren. This transition is the greatest challenge and the opportunity humanity faces in the 21st century. To address this at speed and scale, it needs, we need knowledge, we need innovation, we need solution, and an alignment and reinforcement 
of technologies, policies, finance, markets, and sensible regulation. It also needs an intense focus on our communities, especially our underserved communities, so that everyone is assured a healthy and prosperous future. At the end of the day, this needs to be based on trust. People in California and around the world are hungry for this model of thoughtfulness, of care, of innovation and solutions. It is time for us to step up to the plate and deliver. That is why we are here today, to lay out the opportunity, identify solutions, and build trust. We at Stanford are delighted to host all of you. After five years of intense effort, Stanford launched the Door School of Sustainability, the first school in 75 years, to focus on this issue, to galvanize and mobilize our campus and our community to address the greatest challenge of the 21st century. We use an indigenous saying to describe how we approach this, which my staff has painted this on my office wall to remind me. We do not inherit this earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. We are being asked to reimagine an academic institution and how we engage with and create value for society writ large. We need all of you as fellow travelers in this journey. So thank you for joining us today, and it is my great pleasure to, and an honor to introduce David Hochschild, Chair of the California Energy Commission, to the stage. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, friends. Well, my voice is a little hoarse. I was at the game, uh, and it was, it, was, uh, it was worth it. So um, I want to say we have to win the climate Super Bowl now. And really, um, that will only happen if the great California clean energy experiment succeeds. Uh, we are the birthplace of all of the leading clean energy solutions. The first utility scale solar project in the world built here, first large scale rooftop systems in the world built here, first terrestrial wind system, first electric car, first energy storage project, the first energy codes and standards. We are the birthplace. And the relationship with Stanford has been fundamental to all these. And I really want to just thank Arun for your incredible leadership, Precord Institute. Um, and this summit, which I hope will continue, and I want to just begin, if I could, by asking um, those, I'm going to name some names, if you could just stand up uh, and remain standing, uh, those who are involved on the Stanford side for pulling this together, Liang Min, Cindy Williams, Holmes Hummel, Katie Taflin, Kate Gibson, Bruce Kane, Mike Mastern Data, and on the CC side, Colleen Cradell, Lorraine Gonzalez, and Jonah Steinbuck. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you all. All right. So um, I married into a Chinese family 20 years ago. Um, my wife's uh, father's from Beijing. And our mother's from Hangzhou. And my kids went to Chinese school. And I was very interested uh, in this, this word, Weiji, right? The, the word for crisis in, in Chinese is made up of two other words uh, put together, danger and opportunity. And I have found in my life, um, this holds true with every crisis. There's always opportunity inside the crisis. And that's true of the climate crisis as well, because inside of this climate crisis we're in, um, we have the chance to build something beautiful and powerful um, that's going to reach very far, not just around the nation, but around the world. And so we're leaning into that. Uh, and really, I think the main lesson is that the future we're building is going to run largely through wires and not through pipes. And those wires in California are delivering clean power. Um, we're today at about 60% carbon-free electricity on the grid. We're uh, aiming to get to two-thirds uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and really, alternative energy is the wrong word to use to describe renewables in California, fossils alternative. Um, 
and really we're getting these industries uh, to scale. And the law has now been passed, uh, the, the governor signed two years ago, which requires us to get to 90% clean energy by 2035 and 100% by 2045. Um, and you know, when this was passed, uh, it's not long ago, it was 2018. We were the second state in the country to do this. Hawaii was first in 2015. You know, and this concept was mocked. I was at many forums where it was just uh, laughed at. Well, now it's, it's law in 21 states. President Biden has set as the goal uh, for the country. And I think it's another example of California policy driving clean energy uh, mainstream. So uh, along with that is an equally important trend, which is really the electrification of almost everything. And again, California is playing a huge role. Obviously, you know, Tesla has now surpassed Toyota to be the best-selling car in the state of California. We're the first state in the country where the best-selling vehicle is electric. But along with that, uh, you know, zero motorcycles, which we fund, making electric motorcycles, electric scooters, bikes, the Ford F-150 Lightning, uh, electric buses. Uh, just last week, California received the very first electric tugboat in the world in San Diego. And then electric ferries are coming. I just came back uh, with some of my staff a few months ago from Norway which has done 53 electric ferries. These are not small ferries. These are full-scale ferries. You get on this thing. The main thing you notice, it's totally quiet in addition to being clean. And um, the ferry takes seven minutes to disembark all the passengers for the next group to get on, fully recharges in that time, and can go out for another two hours. That's coming. And what we want really is for everything that connects to the grid to be a good citizen of the grid. And that's a big focus for us at the Energy Commission uh, in partnership with our sister agencies for how do we, how do we best support the grid as we scale uh, all this clean energy here. So uh, another favorite Chinese crop proverb of mine, the people who say it can't be done should get out of the way of the people who are doing it. So in California, I think one of the things that really has distinguished us was Governor Newsom's leadership at the height of the fires in 2020 um, in adopting the very first electric vehicle mandate requiring that 100% of passenger vehicles be electric by 2035. And this is in the middle of COVID, in the middle of wildfires. Uh, and again, this was mocked, it was dismissed, and now the EU has done it, others are doing it, uh, and it's really driving electric vehicles mainstream. And today, uh, as many of you know, we set another important milestone, which is now that, that um, we're at 25% of new vehicle sales are electric, up from 5%. So it's happening. And it, to me, it's not just that the electrification of the transportation fleet is possible, it's that it's inevitable. And what our job is to do is to make it happen as fast as we can. So uh, again, Tesla being a great example here, um, they're making about 2,000 electric cars a day on the Fremont line. That is the most productive car factory of any kind in all of North America. EV charging stations up to 98 chargers in one location there in Coalinga. We're at uh, now about 94,000 chargers uh, for the state. Uh, that's more ch electric vehicle chargers than there are gasoline nozzles in the state of California, about 60,000 gasoline nozzles. We're also bringing other technologies to scale, the largest solar rooftop just down the road here uh, at the Apple headquarters, um, the world's largest geothermal power plant, uh, the geysers, uh, about two hours north of us in Lake and Napa counties, um, and we're home as well to the world's largest battery storage project in Moss Landing. Um, and I will just pause on this for a moment. Uh, you know, it's interesting to note, there, there are a lot of people who are actively rooting for California to fail. I think it's important to, to note that. In this particular project, there was uh, one of those units caught fire because of a, basically not, it wasn't a battery chemistry issue, it was the vent hood uh, was installed the wrong way. So rain got in, caused a short. The fire was outside, uh, you know, in a, the, it was a unit was uh, in a, in a uh, enclosed metal shipping container on a concrete pad. The fire didn't spread, no grid outages, no injuries, no fatalities, but there was an editorial in the Wall Street Journal the next day about the dangers, you know, battery storage poses to the nation. You know, meanwhile, I have issues with our gas fleet all the time. We had, a, we had a unit in Hayward that blew up and sent a chunk of metal flying 1,200 feet through a um, community center kitchen. You know, it gets no national press. And so I just think it's important to note this article in the Wall Street Journal felt a little bit like the obituaries, you know, had already been written and they're looking where to place it. But I note that because I think it's important to, to realize how many um, 
folks there are who are actually really rooting for our, our California clean energy experiment to fail. But in fact, it's succeeding. And we are adding a colossal amount of battery storage. California is the fastest growing, largest battery storage market in the world. Um, and by March of this year, we expect to get to 10 gigawatts of storage. That's basically building 10 gigawatts in five years. All right, our peak load is 52 gigs, so a colossal push, and we're gonna do much more. Uh, this is really gonna help enable a lot more solar and wind uh, to come onto the grid, and overall the system is working great, so uh, more of that to come. To couple all this, we're also doing a big push on offshore wind. Uh, California's the first state on the west coast of the United States to do offshore wind, and uh, about a year ago, we did the first federal lease sale, 583 square miles off the central and the northern coast that have now been leased by these five leaseholders uh, to develop 25 gigs of offshore wind in California. Um, these turbines are massive. One rotation of the turbine powers two houses for a day. That's the scale that they're at. When I started working in this field on offshore wind seven years ago, the largest turbine in the world was six megawatts. Now there's a 22 megawatt turbine being built. So again, just incredible innovation uh, and opportunity here because um, this resource you can deploy 20 miles offshore uh, and it can provide clean power um, uh, for the state. So we're leaning in uh, heavily to that. We're also doing, my colleague, uh, Commissioner Andrew McAllister is, is with us today, and one of the things he's been terrific on is helping s uh, support load flexibility. So we set the first ever uh, load flexibility goal for the state, seven gigawatts, um, and we're now, with a new authority we have, we're requiring this for various appliances. So pool pumps being the first one we just did, they represent about 500 megawatts of load in the state, and now you, you know, we have a new reg, so you can't sell those products into California without a grid dispatchable feature. And we're doing, gonna be doing that for electric heat pumps and a whole bunch else to make everything that connects to the grid a good citizen of the grid. We're also pushing hard with electric homes, all electric homes. It costs about $5,000 to add gas pipe to a home and now all these features that gas provided, you look at um, hot water heating and furnace and so it can be done by electric heat pumps, induction cooktops, and so there's a big movement uh, both through code and incentives and builder innovation towards uh, all electric homes. Some of the big challenges we have to overcome together, uh, we really have to triple our build out of renewables and that means doing things faster, creating more friction free processes. Uh, and dealing with um, offshore wind as well. It's incredibly complex uh, to do that. We've got to do ports and transmission, uh, look at manufacturing, uh, and uh, super complex. The governor's just announced a terrific new offshore wind advisor, Janet Gannon, who'll be starting in a few weeks, and then to deal with transmission uh, to scale uh, as we do all this. So none of this is easy, but it's all um, in the realm of a solvable problem. And there we go. Uh, I want to make one point about the economy. As we started this you know, grand clean energy experiment, we were the 10th largest economy in the world. Then we passed Russia and Italy and Brazil and France and the UK. Uh, and now we're the uh, fifth largest economy in the world. And I think it's worth noting that it's possible to decarbonize at the same time as you have a healthy economy. Um, and California, I think, is as a poster child for that. Uh, is a great example for the rest of the country uh, and the world. Uh, is, does this, there we go. Okay, I wanna close with this. All right, um, I think the way to think about what we're doing with moving beyond fossil fuels to a clean energy fuel, to, to clean energy future, is really to see it through the lens of the story of smoking in America. So both my grandfathers were in World War II Every American soldier, every day, got daily rations in food, chocolate, and a pack of cigarettes, okay? So a generation of American men came home from World War II as uh, smokers. Half the country smoked. President Kennedy smoked, Marilyn Monroe smoked. Some people say they smoked together. Some of you guys will get that. Uh, Johnny Carson smoked on The Tonight Show. Cartoons, Fred Splinter smoked. Doctors did ads for cigarettes, okay? That's how widespread smoking was. And then the truth came out, hey, smoking causes cancer and secondhand smoke causes cancer. And so what was the response from the tobacco industry in the United States to that science, okay? They went from 
making one product, cigarettes, to making two products. They made cigarettes and they made doubt. They manufactured doubt. They put $100 million into junk science to distort that basic truth. So what happened next is very instructive because ultimately science won and truth won. And we got health warnings on packaging, cigarette advertising, banning, ban, banned advertising from television, uh, cigarette taxes, and so on. This line did not come through. But basically, we dropped smoking down to 9%. It's really one of the great success stories uh, in American history for public health. And I think we can do the same for climate and clean energy. So thank you all. <laughs>